night. And let's see, we're going to be here one second. Uh, it, a call to order, and our invocation will be by the um, dedicate, dedicated uh, Right Reverend Lewis Jones. <laughs> <laughs> bow our head folks dear heavenly father we know that you always are near us and beside us in all that we do we ask that you be with us this evening as we consider the affairs of this our great city grant us the patience to listen the wisdom to decide and the courage to act we offer this prayer in your holy name amen amen, amen. pledge of allegiance i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Madam Clerk, do we have a roll call? Yes, Your Honor, all present. All right, that is wonderful. Could I have a motion for the certification of the closed session? So moved. Second. Okay, vote is open. We are moving along. Oh, stars. Let's try again. Let's. Give us a sec. Oh, I said stars. I'm sorry. <laughs> Better than the other words. Give me just a second. We'll try to get this to work again. <coughs> you think you're going to have a new move. system to learn? I'll yeah. tell you what. Why don't we just move to another building? One, let's see, folks. See. <laughs> it's, it's not going to work. Let's just go ahead and do a verbal vote. Sorry about that. Councilmember Berlucci? Aye. French? Aye. Councilmember, I mean, Mayor Dyer? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? Aye. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Ralph? Aye. Councilmember Towers? Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. You're certified to close session and be in accordance with a motion to recess. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now we're going to move for approval of the informal and formal session of April 19th, 2022, and the special formal session of April 20th, 2022. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Let's Vote is open. Try again. Let's Maybe. <laughs> nope. Let's just, we're going to leave this alone tonight. Councilmember Berlucci? Um, yes, with an abstention on uh, April 20th. Okay. Or 20, uh, the special session, pardon me. Well, that was the April 20th. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Brandt? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Tower. Aye. Councilmember Rouse. Aye. Councilmember Wooten. Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson. Aye. Mayor Dyer. Aye. By a vote of 11 to 0, <coughs> except for Mr. Ber Councilmember Bellucci's abstention, you have approved the minutes as submitted. Okay, as they say, the eyes have. Alrighty. All right, we're going to be moving on now, uh, you know, to some you know, presentations. Uh, first one up is the National <clears throat> Travel and Tourism Week, and we're going to ask John Circle and Terry Wiley to come up. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. All right, we're proud to uh, read this uh, you know, proclamation. Established in 1983 by the Congressional Resolution National Travel and Tourism Week, in, a, in an annual tradition held for the U.S. travel community to unite and recognize the value the travel industry holds for our economy, businesses, and personal well-being. And whereas following a two-year travel uh, downturn, America is now embracing travel recovery and return to growth with great optimism for a promising future as travelers e eagerly return to the road and explore our great country. Whereas in Virginia Beach, a passionate contingency of more than 15,000 hospitality heroes stand ready to provide guests to our city with the first-class customer service and southern hospitality. Virginia Beach is known for. Enduring the NTTW, 
the citizens of Virginia Beach community offer special thanks and gratitude to these stalwart advocates of the industry we hold near and dear to our hearts in the city, in our city. Whereas I, Robert M. Dyer, Mayor of the City Beach, do hereby proclaim May 1 through 7th National Tourism, Travel and Tourism Week, and I encourage all citizens to observe this week with the appropriate ceremonies and activities. Okay. And I think we have a little event coming up soon, too, correct? Yes, Thursday. I'd love to have you chat about that. This uh, Thursday, we have the uh, National Travel and Tourism Week uh, luncheon, where we'll be giving awards to the, some of the top hospitality workers in the city. Uh, everyone from dishwashers to housekeepers to front desk clerks to you name it, anybody in the business. So it's a very nice thing to do and nice that the city takes care of the hospitality field like they do. So we appreciate your support. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you. All righty. <laughs> All right, thanks a bunch. Thank you. <clears throat> you know what is really cool about Virginia Beach is we get to honor so many uh, great people. Uh, Mr. Bellucci, uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, if you can kindly. Thank you, Mayor. Um, whereas mental health is essential to every individual's overall health and well-being, and whereas all individuals face challenges at some point in life that can impact their mental health, and whereas mental health affects people of all ages, races, ethnicities, and income levels in Virginia Beach, and whereas over half of adults with mental illness do not receive treatment, and whereas feelings of personal shame and fears of social stigma and discrimination prevent many living with mental illness from seeking help, and whereas untreated mental illness leads to higher rates of emergency department visits, hospitalizations, incarcerations, school dropouts, and suicides, and whereas the mental health of every citizen is essential to the emotional and economic prosperity of our families, neighborhoods, and businesses, and whereas mental health conditions are treatable with early intervention, individuals can, uh, reco can recover to lead full productive lives, and whereas increasing the awareness of mental illness can reduce the stigma around mental illness, thus reducing community fear, mistrust, and violence against people with mental illness who are significantly more likely to be the victims than the perpetrators of violent crimes, and <coughs> whereas greater public awareness about mental wellness can positively transform attitudes about and towards people who live with mental illness, making it easier for our citizens to seek help, and whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen share in the responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts. Now, therefore, Bobby Dyer, the mayor of Virginia Beach, do hereby proclaim May 2022 as Mental Health Awareness Month. So thank you. Thank you. Is anybody here to receive that? Oh, Michael, if you could do the honors. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. We so appreciate the proclamation and the acknowledgement of the need for mental health awareness. And we thank you so much for your support. Oh, thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> and Vice Mayor Wilson, there's something to hear on the Historic Preservation Month. And if, if Mark Reed and whoever... Bill Gambrell, come on up, Mark. Mark, you come up, too. Yeah. Come on. The dynamic duo. Yes. So, uh, so proud to be part of this group since its inception and, and the work that you've been doing over the years. So, <clears throat> whereas the National Trust for Historic Preservation created Preservation Week in 1973 to spotlight grassroots efforts in historic preservation in America, 
and whereas President Richard M. Nixon signed a resolution designating the week of May 6th to the 12th, 1973, as National Preservation Week, and whereas the National Trust expanded the celebration to a month-long observance in 2005, and whereas states and communities across the country now recognize the month of May as Historic Preservation Month, and whereas Virginia Beach has 23 individual historic properties and five historic districts listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and whereas Virginia Beach has 79 historic properties listed in the Virginia Beach Historical Register, and whereas the Virginia Beach City Council established the Historic Preservation Committee in 2008 <clears throat> to advise them on all issues related to the preservation of historic buildings, structures, and sites in the city. And whereas the city of Virginia Beach was designated a certified local or, uh, government by the National Park Service in uh, 2016, recognizing that Virginia Beach has put key elements in a sound sorry, preservation program in place for our community. And whereas the, the Historic Preservation Community Commission recognizes that the majority of, of the week of historic preservation commitments. Sorry. You had a lot to read today. I did. <laughs> with, the, um, <laughs> with the encouragement of local, uh, state, and federal governments. And whereas the... <clears throat> Whereas the theme of Historic Preservation Month 2022 is People Saving Places. And let me see how no, that, you give all Go this? ahead and give it to them. Good stuff. So, anyway, signed by Robert M. Dyer, Historic Preservation Month. Thank you. Good stuff. Rosemary, please do the presentation. Staff paparazzi, so you know. Thank you. Just make it. <laughs> just, just real briefly, I'd just like to thank the council for all the help that they've given historic preservation in the near recent past. And um, Miss, Miss Hanley, probably of all the people on council, has been working preservation since um, for a while. I, um, I just cannot tell you how thankful I am for all the people that really buy into the idea that this is really a good thing for our community. And I will tell you, thank you again and again. Mr. Mayor, before we sit down, yes. before we sit down, one thing, uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as we discuss and celebrate this historic preservation month, uh, I would like to urge all of our citizens to visit our city website and check out the work that has been done by the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, I recently read two historical nominations, one for SeaTac, which is one of the oldest historically African American communities in Virginia, located just west of the Virginia Beach Oceanfront. Its origins go back over 200 years. And another nomination is for Ellen J. Gardens. Ellen J. Gardens is a post-war suburban neighborhood that was developed by Walter Riddick and his sister Lillian in the 1950s and 60s, specifically for upper middle class African American professionals. Named for their parents, Lizzie and John Riddick, Ellen J. Gardens provided a suburban enclave for African American families that were prevented from buying homes in many other neighborhoods due to discriminatory practices. Both of these nominations were very informative, representing our heritage here in Virginia Beach. Thank you for that work on that. Thank you again. I'll just, Thank you, I would Robert. be remiss with not telling you that you've got a great group of volunteers and, um, and bringing Mark Reed back after he retired to help this commission has been a wonderful thing. Thank you again. No, no such thing as retirement in Virginia Beach. <laughs> Amen. We all know that Bill worked for the city as one of our planners. I'm <coughs> but I am retired. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bill, you're just doing other stuff. Okay, great. All right, now it's my pleasure uh, for a resolution. Whereas the small village of Virginia Beach, on a cold December afternoon in 1951, attorney J. Peter Holland III found himself at the scene of an accident. A local woman had been struck by a car near the corner of 24th Street 
and Atlantic Avenue, but there was no ambulance available until an hour later. He and some friends worked to establish an active volunteer ambulance service in Virginia Beach, and on May 1st of 1952, the, uh, the Princess Anne Virginia Beach Rescue Squad Incorporated began operations. Whereas the incorporation of the city of Virginia Beach and Princess Anne County in 1963, the growing demand for emergency medical services necessitated the formation of an other rescue squads operating within fire stations. But the membership of the Virginia Beach Princess Anne Rescue Squad elected to remain as an independent organization operated by volunteers on a 24-hour basis with no charge for services. In 1963, it also voted to change the name of the squad to the Virginia Beach Rescue Squad, VBVRS. And whereas, <coughs> in 1972, the squad was indeed of daytime volunteers, and for the first time, seven women uh, you know, uh, were uh, recruited. The same year, the emergency coronary care program was established at Virginia Beach, and the very day of graduating from the program, VBVRS members had a successful conversion of the patient and cardiac arrest, the first ever performed by a volunteer squad. And whereas population was growing, the oceanfront was bu busier than ever, and demand for services became, became hard to keep up with. To avoid the same fate that happened to all volunteer fire, the squad, the uh, fire service, the squad launched its first ever volunteer recruitment campaign in March of 1988 with a huge success. And whereas to accommodate long range growth, the squad needed a new station. The city provided land on 17th Street and an interest free construction loan. Ground was broken on January 11th, 1995 and the nine squad vehicles and nearly 100 male and female volunteers had a home in a state-of-the-art facility that became Station 14. And whereas in 2006, a dedicated, skilled VBVRS team competed in the International Rescue and Emergency Care Association's competition against uh, teams from all over the world, VBVRS was the only team that was all volunteer. And VB, VRS was the only team who came out on top. The following year, the Virginia Beach Rescue Squad Foundation, born out of the VB, VRS, expanded its mission to include support for the entire rescue system. Whereas toward the ends of the decade, with a strong need for EMS services in the Great Neck area, Station 8 was built with funds from the foundation and the community. VBVRS was committed to manning both stations 24-7 to serve neighborhood needs. Whereas today, Virginia Beach's population has grown to nearly a half a million, with, with millions more visiting each year. And still, the Virginia Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad continues to come and serve the city's needs 24-7. With almost 200 operational support members, VBVRS answers more than 15,000 calls of service in 2021, never faltering even through the two years of a risky pandemic. The Virginia Beach Rescue Volunteer Rescue Squad continues to stand ready night and day, fair weather and foul, to answer the next cry for help. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Virginia Beach City Council, the entire council, pause in its deliberations to recognize the Virginia Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad 
on its 70th anniversary and celebrates the long relationship the city has with the VBVRS. Adapted by the City Council of Virginia Beach on this third day of May 2022 and present the resolution duly signed by each member of the Council of Virginia Beach with a copy spread among the minutes of this meeting and for this our heartfelt thanks for getting a great thing going and making Virginia Beach great and BB strong. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, as uh, one of, of 10 volunteer rescue squads in the city, we're not the only one. We're just celebrating our 70th anniversary. And so on behalf of all of them, um, of course, I want to thank the city council for their continued support over our 70 years um, in pretty much anything we've ever asked of you guys. I appreciate that. And we certainly wouldn't be able to do it without the members of the community as well. Um, and so we're greatly uh, appreciative of everything you guys have done for us, uh, the support in the past, and I thank you for your continued support in the future. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you for a job well done and what you're going to continue to be doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Virginia Beach is blessed with many great, great employees who really step to the plate and distinguish themselves. And I asked uh, Council Member Rouse if he would be so kind to honor one of our great employees, Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jeff, this is, you got to come up. You got to come up, yeah. Jeff. Jeff doesn't uh, particularly like the limelight, but uh, today he, he's going to get it. And I, I am really privileged, Mr. Mayor, to read this resolution because uh, Mr. Smith thinks he's a, at some point in his life, he thinks he's a better basketball player than I am. So <laughs> this is a, a tremendous honor. So let's hope I don't mess this up. Mr. Jeffrey Leroy Smith. I mean, I messed up already. <laughs> Mr. Jeffrey Levon Smith has been an instrumental figure in supporting small women and minority owned businesses in Virginia Beach. And whereas Mr. Smith graduated with a bachelor's in business administration and finance, from Norfolk State University, behold, a, a, there you go, a green and gold, a master's in human resource management and organization development from American University and completed the lead executive training program through the Weldon Cooper Center at the University of Virginia. <laughs> and whereas his career has been a model for public service beginning with the city of Norfolk from 2002 to 2012, with the City of Norfolk, Mr. Smith held positions with fleet management, facility management, and Department of Neighborhood and Leisure Services. In Norfolk's Office of Grants Management, he was the Senior Grants Program Manager, administering funds for various city support programs. Additionally, he worked as a Business Development Manager for Empowerment 2010, Inc., a federal program to enhance child care transportation and job training for low-income residents looking for employment. And whereas, he joined the City of Virginia Beach in 2013 with the Department of Economic Development and worked his way up to business development coordinator, facilitating numerous business expansions. And whereas, as a business development coordinator with the City of Virginia Beach, Mr. Smith led the opening of the Small Business Resource Center, the Hive, and has proactively worked with local educational and private sector entities to provide service delivery within the Hive. Under Mr. Smith, under Mr. Smith's leadership, a small business workshop series and a small business forum was developed in order to facilitate training and promote business opportunities for the community. And whereas during the COVID-19 pandemic, in partnership with LISC Hampton Road and United Way of Southampton Road, he oversaw the grant fund program to provide aid to small businesses. 
and whereas Mr. Smith has actively served on the advisory council of Kentsville High School's Entrepreneur Academy, providing learning opportunities for the students inside and outside the classroom. And as a result, they are recognizing him with the 2022 Virginia Beach City Public Schools Model Partner Award. And whereas, well, now therefore be it resolved that Virginia Beach City Council honors Jeffrey Levon Smith for his efforts to serve the community and his work towards supporting small women and minority owned businesses throughout Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach. Adopted by the Council of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia the third day of May, 2022, to present this resolution duly signed by each member of the Virginia Beach City Council with a copy spread upon the minutes of this meeting. Thank you very much. Aaron, will you do the honor of the room? Jeff. Well, thank you. you know, we'll keep it, we'll just call you Jeff. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Mayor Dyer, uh, Vice Mayor Wilson, <laughs> and council members. Um, obviously, thank you. I'm humble and appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, couldn't stand here without the leadership that uh, City Manager Patrick Gahaney provides us, as well as Deputy City Manager Taylor Adams. They've been nothing but supportive. And clearly, there are other employees who are likely just as deserving. But on behalf of them, thank you, and we look forward to making Virginia Beach great. Thank, Thank you, and God bless you, Jeff. Really appreciate it. <laughs> you know, it's great to honor so many honorable people. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a testimony to the strength of our city, being the people in our city. Okay, moving on to public hearings, acquisition by agreement or condemnation, temporary and uh, public easements at Elbow Road, extended phase 3C, Project CIP uh, 100 159. We have one speaker, uh, Mayor Barbara Messner. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Acquisition by agreement or condemnation. You shouldn't condemn any property because there aren't any needs. Um, you can't take care of what, what we have. Um, this is a temporary and permanent, a temporary, it's like once you tear down all the trees and pour the cement, it's not temporary. You don't go back and undo all this stuff. Ray Elbow Road extended phase two, C project CIP, one zero zero one five nine formally CIP two dash one two four. So I'm in opposition of everything you're doing throughout the city, and I've written to all of you about the roads, uh, you know, the failure to follow OSHA, and um, you know, to make us aware where there's construction and make the roads safe. Okay, and um, that's it. There's other speakers on the first one. No, ma'am. Okay. All right. But I need the mayor to open the second public okay. hearing. Okay. Okay. The sub uh, uh, public hearing would be a proposed franchise agreements for the 600 block of 19th Street on Cypress <laughs> Avenue between 19th Street and 18th Street at Old Farmers Beach Market and in the Vibe Park at, uh, be the Vibe Park on the corner of 18th Street and Cypress Avenue at the Old at Old Market at Old Beach Art and Echo Market. There are two speakers, Ms. Master, you're the first. Okay, and the rest is trading as Old Beach Art and Echo Mart. Okay, you didn't finish reading the whole thing. Anyway, um, the Vibe District Mocha, they've all been wanting their half million and you wanna expand, expand a taxing district. This is a taxing district and that money stays at the oceanfront. Um, it's also, uh, Mr. Berlucci and Mr. Dyer, you were there for, with Ms. Haber for one of these big parties and it backs right up to people's homes. 
there's live music, alcohol, you know, drinking, and you know, it's really not what we need for a family resort. Um, I oppose public-private partnerships with private businesses. It's our money and air land, and you're putting us deeper and deeper in debt. You're not paying down any of the debt. Okay, That's thank it. you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mary Ann Taylor. Y'all won't see it. And then after Ms. Taylor, I'm sure we do have additional figures, is Laura Hoggins. Come on over there. Good evening. And to you. I am Mary Ann Taylor and I help facilitate the Old Beach Art and Eco Market. I check in at almost all markets we have, and I'm always excited by the artists and the vendors and the shoppers in Vibe Park, and I love Vibe Park. Our market is a great place for new artists to offer their work, and eco vendors have a friendly place to sell their products. Some use us as a testing ground to see if retail is in their blood. Do they really want to get up at 6.30 on Saturday morning to sell their art? And Old Beach Art Market makes it easy for them to decide. Many of our people have been with us for years, but we do see turnover, and it's usually positive. I'm always happy when an artist or a vendor outgrows us and goes on to bigger venues, and in a few cases, on to brick and mortar businesses in Virginia Beach. The city of Virginia Beach has a good thing going on here, and I hope it continues, and I appreciate your consideration. And appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Laura Hoggins, and after Ms. Hoggins, we'll have a one WebEx speaker. Okie dokie. Welcome. Um, hi. Nice to see all of you again. Um, I'm Laura, and I'm a local artist and also a vendor at Old Beach Art and Eco Market. And I've come to you again this evening to thank you for all the support that has already been given to the area and to let you know just how important it is to me and also our community. Um, the Vibe District does not just support local small businesses. It's a place um, where our community can come together and um, gather and interact with each other in really enriching ways that are very positive. Whether it's listening to live music from a local musician or learning to make paper, an activity that my kids got to participate in at the Vibe. Um, the Old Beach Art and Eco Market also provides a place for the community to be able to come and buy local products that are handmade, like soap and lotion, um, even furniture. And you can also pick up ecologically friendly items like reusable straws and shopping bags. And this doesn't just support our immediate community, but our broader environment. So reducing shipping and excess packaging and things like that. So, and again, I just want to thank you guys for your time this evening and also your consideration in continuing to support the vibe. Thank you very Thanks. much. The last speaker is via WebEx, Christina Tra Traponi. If you will pause two to three seconds before beginning, you are unmuted and now and may and may begin. Hey everybody, can y'all hear me? Okay. You want to mute her? Can you? I'm back. <laughs> can y'all hear me? Uh, my name is Christina Trapani. I'm the owner of the um, Mania Company. I'm also the co-founder of the Old Beach Art and Eco Market. Um, I actually started the Old Beach Green Market back in 2011. Um, I wanted to thank City Council, City of Virginia Beach, um, for all of your support in the Vibe District, as well as our growing and expanding um, incubator, if you will, at the Old Beach Art and Eco Market. 
Um, I'm actually at the Painted Tree, which is a boutique that's opening up at Hilltop, and I'm standing here with another vendor from the Old Beach Art and Eco Market. Um, I would have to say that that market, and thanks to Laura and the Old Beach Farmers Market and all of their support as well, um, that I probably wouldn't be standing here um, at the Painted Tree getting open, ready to open up a little um, shop up here at Hilltop because the market um, really gave me the opportunity to grow my business to a point where I've been able to stay in business for 14 years now. Um, and I probably have only missed 10 markets in the last 14 years or in the last uh, 12 years. We've been, the Old Beach Green Market started in 2011. Um, and I just have to say that I've seen many vendors, including here in this uh, hilltop area right now that have um, blossomed and grown thanks to the Vibe District and the Old Beach Markets. And I'm really excited to see it uh, continue to grow. It is a wonderful opportunity for artists and local eco-friendly businesses to um, test the waters, how their business is going to do, can they grow, can they move on. And we have such a wonderful following of people that come and um, support us, um, not only locals, but beach visitors as well. I feel like our little Saturday morning hub there and the Vibe District is so important. And um, Again, I, I'm offering my support and I can't wait to see it grow. Thank you. That was our first live remote telecast on WebEx. So, you know, that was good. Thank you. That's all the speakers. Okay. That's all, that's all the speakers, sir. Okay, great. Uh, now we will go ahead and move on. I will read the speaker policy and it's a new one. I want to remind everyone that the city council speaker policy that allows certain representative groups to speak for 10 minutes applies to only the planning items. All other speakers, whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have up to three minutes to speak on a single item. Uh, speakers are reminded that comp uh, co uh, comments during the formal session of meeting must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by council at the time you are called. For items placed on the consent agenda, a speaker may have up to three minutes to address any single item. If a speaker wishes to address multiple consent agent items, the speaker will have a cumulative total of six minutes to address those items. Again, the speaker must limit her, his or her comments to the subject matter of the items they have signed up to address. And finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussions and dis decorum. Whatever views you hold and want to express, the City Council wants to hear from you and to ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do this is for all of us to strive for civility and respect. Okay, if we can call the first person up. Um, Barbara Messner has signed up on all items, Ms. Messner. And then welcome back, and Ms. Messner, you'll have six minutes for all items. Okay, but are any pulled? I thought it was uh, just the ones that were pulled. J4 and K1 are the only two pulled. Okay. You'll have six minutes J4 and J2? Nope. No, ma'am. J4 and K1. J4 and K1 are the only ones that I'll be limited on, correct? No. You have six minutes to speak on every other item. Okay. And that's a violation of my free speech. Your timing. Okay. And, um... The first one under resolutions is uh, a franchise with the uh, on public property, and these are all, anything on public property with public land and public money. New debt. You don't have money. You have debt. And you have a three billion dollar budget and three billion dollar debt. Five hundred sixty-seven million for the first phase of the bond referendum. You don't, you don't have money. So I think it's important to remind people uh, about the conflicts, and I don't want to be interrupted. 
Uh, Mr. Holcomb is a sheriff and has major conflicts on votes, on funding, and being on commissions and committees related to uh, crime and violence in our city. Virginia Beach has deposited over 100,000 uh, or million, I forget which it is, in Town Bank. I don't have time to do all of this. Uh, which finances CIP and private developer projects. Um, yeah, and Mr. Moss is, uh, you know, even though he says, you know, he he can uh, abstain, he doesn't have to abstain, he can still be, um, you know, unbiased. I don't think it's fair for him to make that decision and for the city attorney who works for him to make that decision for anyone here. Uh, Mr. Dyer's taking money from MEB Sports, Breeden, Coastal Hospitality, Tommy Lines, uh, Russell Lines, Stephen Ballard, Ms. Wooten, 13500 from GTS Global, uh, from employee Ben Davenport, who, uh, who is there, um, Mr. Berlucci, campaign uh, director that Sesame's used, okay. Um, and he was given, uh, well, Kaufman and Knowles and all the same people helped Mr. Berlucci. Uh, I'll have to do that one uh, on the 10th. Ms. Wilson, who tried to correct me, uh, there's a letter on file, her letter, 2020. She receives commissions and sales from Howard Hanna Real Estate. And Mr. Thurman, who's the chairman and on the board of Howard Hanna, is also on the board of Westminster Canterbury, which I think that's one reason that Mr. Wood's not still here. Mr. Jones abstained, and the code is 2.23115 because his ownership with Holloman Brown Funeral Homes has agreement with Westminster Canterbury to provide funeral services for, um, for those residents. What other agreements with private companies does he and other city uh, people on, you know, in the city have? Um, okay. And this is for all items. This is this is absolutely ridiculous. Um, Sixteen million revenue bonds, more debt from Economic Development Authority. And the reason I didn't stand up for Mr. Smith is because I oppose the Economic Development Authority, the Debt Authority. Why are we helping Cape Henry Private Collegiate School? <clears throat> and uh, I've sent y'all pictures of the blight. Alaskan Road, you know, that money should not be retained. It should have been, uh, in 91, I asked for it to be, you know, a park. We don't have enough real parks. Uh, it's blighted. It has asbestos. It was deliberate blight. Y'all have ignored that, and I've sent you pictures since 2013 of the blight, asbestos, uh, the, the wiring, everything. Uh, I think Mr. Sutton, I did a FOIA request on the school buses and on that property, and he wanted to charge me a $1,000 FOIA request. We have a right to this information. You know, a lot of the kids that get sick, it's because of, um, you know, the mold. The pictures I have of some of those portables outside are absolutely disgusting, and they were testing children in, in, those, in that building. So that land should go back to the citizens and it should be a real park, not a cement venue and not a mixed use thing for some other developer. You failed to keep us safe, healthy and safe. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Moss. Well, I don't want anybody watching TV to think there's <coughs> any accuracy as to Ms. Messner's representation representation of my conflict of interest. In fact, she always talks about the only person that gives opinions legally is the Commonwealth attorney. I have such an opinion. The state law says it's up for me to personally judge whether or not I believe I can act objectively, which I believe that I can. 
and it's up to the people when they vote at the polls to decide whether they like the judgment that I exercise. But I have no undisclosed uh, potential conflict or appearance of conflicts, and I do believe that I can act objectively, and I think my voting record reflects that quite frequently. But anyway, but thank you, Mr. Mayor, for a chance to clarify and set yeah. the record straight. Ms. Putin. I'm going to make sure I make this correction, and I'm sure GTS will like me to do uh, the same as well. I haven't received uh, 13400 from GTS. Thank you. Ms. Wilson. And I would like to say that, um, uh, yes, Mr. Thurman is on the board of Westminster Canterbury, and the last time something came up for Westminster, I abstained. Okay, thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, in alignment of what my uh, council members just said, you know, be assured, public, that this is a council of extreme integrity that is operating in your best interest. Thank you. Okay, Madam Vice uh, Mayor. Okay, consent agenda. Under ordinances and resolutions, number one is the ordinance to grant two franchise agreements regarding open markets on public property to Old Beach Art Market and Old Beach Farmers Market in the 600 block of 19th Street on Cypress Avenue between 19th Street and 18th Street and the Vibe Park. Number two, the resolution to readopt procedures <coughs> for the selection and evaluation award of design, build, and construction and energy contract <coughs> adopted June 26, 2012. Uh, number C, the resolution to authorize the issues, uh, issuance of revenue bonds not to exceed $16 million by the City of Virginia Beach Development Authority regarding Cape Henry Collegiate School. Um, <clears throat> number five, ordinances to accept and appropriate a $31,866.72 from Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation to the FY 2021-22 Police Department operating budget regarding purchase automated external defibrillators to be used in patrol vehicles. And B is $26,918.40 from the Virginia Department of Health Office of Emergency Medical Services to the FY 2021-22 Department of Emergency Medical Services operating budget regarding equipment and training to support rescue squad operations. And C is $131,226 from the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Development Service in the FY 2021-22 Department of Human Services operating budget regarding infant program. D. $1,914,214 from the Virginia Office of Children's Services uh, <clears throat> to the FY 2021-22 Department of Human Services Operating Budget and transfer $751,115 within the FY 2021-22 Department of Human Services to support the required local match regarding the Children's Services Act program. And then five, ordinances to transfer $360,327 from the general <clears throat> fund reserve open for contingencies to the FY 2021-22 voter registration and elections operating budget regarding public elections on June 20, primary elections on June 21st, 2022. Uh, B, and we're going to defer to uh, May 10th, uh, $15,000 from City Council Reserve Open Emergent Needs to the FY 2021-22 uh, Convention and visit, Visitors uh, Bureau Operating Fund to authorize the City Manager to execute a sponsorship agreement with Teen Lamb uh, TLLC and support Juneteenth at the, the beach. Requested by Mayor Dyer and Council Member Wooten. Open up public hearing on planning. And that would be uh, number two. Ordinance to amend section 201 of the city zoning ordinance CZO um, regarding setbacks for in ground pools uh, adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, motion. Motion to approve. Okay, second. we have a second. Second. Discussion? <clears throat> Let's give it a shot. Nope, we're going to have to do a verbal <clears throat> vote. It is. <laughs> we're moving to another building, Amanda. Let Please. So, Councilmember Bellucci. Aye. Councilmember Brandt. Aye. Councilmember Holcomb. Aye. Councilmember Henley. Aye. Councilmember Jones. Aye. Councilmember Moss. Yes, on all items except item four, because 
if my wife was a city employee, I could <coughs> vote yes on this. But since this is a singular vote on a singular issue for a singular governmental entity, the Commonwealth four. Attorney has instructed that I have to abstain. I, I, I think that's been polled. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, I'm sorry. I stand back. I stand no. corrected. Yeah, I no. marked it here, and I didn't change it. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cower? Aye. Councilmember Rao? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Councilmember Wilson? Uh, Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. By a vote of 11 to 0, you've approved the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wilson. Okay. Then I think we're now moving uh, to item number four under ordinances. Ordinance to approve the sale of the school board prop property at 1413 Laskin Road and allow the school board to retain the sale proceeds. Uh, we have two speakers, Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner will be Sarah Gerloff. Okay. Four, correct? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Okay. Uh, property on 1413 Laskin Road. Uh, like I said, this is deliberate blight, and it's also in the in the jet. You know, even if the jets are gone, because you all have all these deals with Oceana land use, which you shouldn't have any business doing business with them, uh, and Anyway, like I said, it's blighted property, deliberate blight, and it's mixed use. We don't, you haven't even finished the road projects. Um, Laskin Road, maybe 2024 for you to replace all the rundown storm drains, storm drains that aren't working. The pump station at Laskin Community Chapel still does not work, it's still flooded. Uh, how can you build on flooded property? Why would you build on flooded property? And all these retention ponds, you know, that, that child that just drowned, all these retention ponds should be fenced. It's negligence, like the one out at the brewery. Um, you know, you approve that. It needs to be fenced. Parents are... are drunk in there and the kids are running around they could fall in there and drown so I'm opposed to you um, you know having more projects when you don't take care of what you have and especially the school board the kids aren't even in school on and off for the mass you have parties with uh, I heard a couple people you know went to the uh, Jimmy Buffett show you know so you know the school board runs things totally different than y'all, but they should not be getting money, proceeds from the sale. The school board is just as messed up as the city, so I'm in opposition. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Gerloff. Good evening. Since ours is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, we, the good people, are the true government. We are the rightful owners of 1413 Laskin Road, and since our government is one of consent, I do not consent to my portion of 1413 Laskin Road being sold to a developer that intends to create more retail and apartment space, since this puts more strain on our environment and the taxpayers. Virginia Beach has been turned into one big slab of concrete by the land shark developers that have been greedily gobbling up every inch of land in sight. With so little pervious soil left to absorb rainwater, our city now has a drainage and flooding problem. Now the taxpayers must spend more money to clean up the flooding mess these developers have caused. Due to the overdevelopment of Virginia Beach, we have also, we also have a surplus of buildings. Just take a drive around town and you will notice plenty of for rent and for lease signs. Virginia Beach does not need new construction. 
since there's plenty of old construction in need of makeover. What happens when these developers cannot sell or lease their properties due to oversaturation of the market? Well, they declare bankruptcy, which puts more strain on the banks that, then, that have loaned them our money. The government then has to bail out these banks by printing more money, which is inflation, or by raising taxes, thus increasing the financial strain on the taxpayers while the land sharks swim away. Remember Sal Alinsky's Eight Steps to Take Down a Nation? This is yet another example of how communism has been allowed to creep into our country. Alinsky said, increase the poverty level as high as possible by destroying the middle class taxpayers by increasing the debt to an unsustainable level so you can increase the taxes and produce more poverty, a vicious cycle. By wheeling and dealing with the greedy land sharks, you have been ushering, helping to usher in communism. I don't know, and I do not know about you, but I certainly do not want to live in a communist country where they strip you of everything. Your money is replaced with social credits, and if you do not behave accordingly, you do not receive credit to purchase anything. Absolutely no liberty. Guess what happens that is even worse than having no money? Well, if the powers that be decide they take a liking to one of your family members, they take her. That's when you real, finally realize what truly is of value in this world. Maybe that is when you finally change your wicked ways, when it is too late. This is what happens when you deal with those devils and you kick God's common law of the land to the curb. Yes, every one of you did this. You have created quite the ring of fire. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, at this point, do we have a motion? I move for approval. Sec, do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Vote is open. Sorry, we have shut. Oh, up. we got to go. Yeah, we'll I keep on forgetting. Uh, Council I'm programmed. I apologize. Councilmember Bellucci. Aye. Councilmember Brandt. Aye. Councilmember Holcomb. Aye. Councilmember Henley. Aye. Councilmember Jones. Aye. Councilmember Moss. Now, I'm abstaining Sir. for the reasons I previously <laughs> stated. And when it comes back for the rezoning application, since the school board is the property owner, I'll be abstaining on the rezoning as well for the very same reasons. And you can use the letter from the Commonwealth attorney and just insert it into the record, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Repetition is always a good thing on clarity. Councilmember Tower. Aye. Councilmember Ralph. Aye. Councilmember Wooten. Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson. Aye. Mayor Dyer. Aye. By a vote of 10 to 0, you've approved the, the um, <coughs> resolution. Okay, now we're on to planning. And uh, there's a resolution to adopt and amend the Virginia Beach Comprehensive Plan 2016 Gray Stormwater Impacts on Discretionary Land Use ap Applications. Uh, the first speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner is Brad Martin. Um, adopt and amend. I wish we had uh, some idea of how many amendments you've made in resolutions um, to the comp plan, 2016 comp plan, stormwater impacts for discretionary land use applications, staff approval, planning commission denial. You know, it's it's fascinating. Uh, I just looked at uh, the planning meeting. Y'all appoint those people to do what you want them to do. 2016, um, we haven't done anything about storm water since 2016 except use money at the oceanfront, 18th Street, the Thompson pumps for Ash Asheville Park, 11 million. You move the water to retention ponds, which are dangerous and it's also polluting. Um, I mean, all the geese, all the people that, all the uh, wildlife that are displaced, like 70 acres from Owls Creek for GTS Global. It was Ben Davenport, not G GTS Global, that um, donated the money. Um, yeah. I'm opposed to planning. You shouldn't plan anything until you fix what you have. You can't operate as kings and queens and your kings and queens of nepotism 
It's, it's ridiculous. You're not keeping us safe. I don't know if you look at the news and there's car crashes and everything every single day. And when Newtigate said that uh, you know, there was only one shooting at the oceanfront, there's other, other neighborhoods other than the oceanfront. Thank you. Next speaker is Brad Martin. After Mr. Martin is Claudia Cotton. Hey, Brad. Good evening, Mayor Dyer and Council members. I am Brad Martin, and I've been a civil engineer in Tidewater for 29 years. Let me first say that the development community is generally supportive of reasonable and measurable stormwater analysis requirements, even if they are more burdensome. 1.5 feet of sea level rise and 20% heavier rainfalls are proper protections that we're incorporating into our designs. That said, these proposed changes to the comprehensive plan do not match the stormwater design standards adopted by City Council in February and March of this year, even beyond the change from 0, 0.00 to 0 0.04. The verbiage of no impact is incongruous with the allowances in the regulations that if the local area does not experience current flooding, then the proposed project can increase the tailwater, but not cause flooding. So a design result specifically allowed in the regulations for almost two years will be eliminated by this no impact clause tonight. I think it is also important to understand what is intended by the no impact as well. The dynamics and the results of this modeling software can be analyzed, and I expect in every single case, they will show that there has been some measurable impact on the public stormwater system, maybe higher over here but lower over there, or a heavier flow rate earlier in the storm leads to a lower runoff volume later. There is always an impact, even if it's beneficial. But more importantly than the precision of our analyses, though, is the fact that we now have to consider how an attorney or a judge would interpret the proposed change in the comprehensive plan. I don't have to tell you that we've entered into a litigious era with regard to these processes. Recent projects have made their way through planning staff, the planning commission, and then city council approval, and subsequently the disaffected stakeholder neighbors have filed suit to stop the projects. In cases like those, with this no impact verbiage you're considering tonight, essentially tie the hands of the determining authority and disqualify a future project even based on the most inconsequential impact when the overall analysis is substantially positive. We're not just talking about making things more difficult on consultants like me or more risky, costly, and burdensome on the developers. Please think about the chilling effect that this would have on the potential for future economic development in the city. As prospective de developers bypass Virginia Beach entirely because it's not worth the risk to even begin the process of a development project. It could completely unravel because of a judge's interpretation of no impact. The solutions for our stormwater and flooding problems can be found in the referendum the voters approved last November and a diligent maintenance and repair program which should be the cornerstone of our stormwater program funds moving forward. I don't think this proposed change to the comprehensive plan is what we citizens voted for, and I encourage you, you. to disapprove it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Claudia Cotton. And then after Ms. Cotton is Tuck Bowie. Hey, good, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, Mr. Duhane. So I don't mean to interrupt, but are you representing a group? I have you yes. down. Okay, just want to make sure. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Claudia Cotton. I'm here representing the Coastal Virginia Building Industry Association. We're a regional trade association representing residential and light commercial construction trades and employees in Hampton Roads. Uh, we've consistently been engaged with the work on the stormwater and flooding in the city as stakeholders and will continue to be. <laughs> we think we have a very important role to play. We work hard to balance meeting all the regulations for development and building with trying to keep housing affordable. We all know the comp plan is a policy document. It serves to guide land use decisions. It does not apply to administrative acts like engineering site plans where stormwater is addressed. 
zoning decisions to or policy decisions regarding appropriate land use for property. Engineering for development happens after the policy decisions have been made. We would ask you to consider before you um, act on it, this resolution that do we know the capacity of all the stormwater system improvements that the bond referendum projects will create? Do we know if that capacity will only address current land uses? Will it address future development under existing zoning? Will it address future development under recommended land use in the comp plan? These are important questions. I look back through all the public communication websites, et cetera, for the referendum, and I didn't see a mention of the comp plan resolution language. The only thing I found was this, and I quote, these projects are intended to meet a standard that limits peak flood water to three inches or less above the crown of the road for the 10-year storm event and to prevent the flooding of structures for the 100-year storm event. So to me, this does not mean no impact. We strongly urge you to take the recommendations from your planning commission twice and your process improvement steering committee and vote no on this comp plan resolution. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? Thank you, Claudia. The next speaker is Chuck Bowie. <clears throat> and then uh, Chris Wood. Good evening, Tuck. How you doing? I'm great. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council. My name is Tuck Bowie. I'm a local developer. I guess I'm a land shark based on the previous speaker. Uh, I'm also a, uh, um, a member of the task force and stakeholders group that was put together by Councilman Jones and Moss and City Manager Duhaney. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you folks and the staff, the planning staff and the public work staff in providing a number of us an opportunity to uh, work on that committee. There were a lot of good things that came out of it. Uh, I think there's still some work to be done. Uh, but uh, I'm also the past chair for the last 10 years of the Process Improvement Steering Committee and now serve as vice chair of that committee. And you all have, as part of your uh, documents tonight, a letter from our committee. We met last week. We voted unanimously. Uh, to recommend to council to oppose this amendment to the uh, comprehensive plan. I I'm not going to get into the weeds of the technical side of things. I think that uh, time will tell whether or not the hard work that was done by the committee uh, will show that it's going to prove out to, to be successful. Uh, but I think I I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that you're taking a technical document and trying to put it in the, the comprehensive plan. There was discussion at the Planning Commission uh, work session that, uh, that was suggested by your one of your deputy city attorneys that the language that's in there for the southern watershed probably shouldn't have been in there. Now you're, now you're making this a, a requirement for, for all development. So I, I, I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here when I tell you there's, there's no more greenfield opportunities in the city of Virginia Beach. If there are, they're very limited. What's going to happen development-wise in the future is either going to be infill development or redevelopment. And it's going to be in areas where your infrastructure is already taxed, and it's going to be very difficult and very expensive to do that. So one of two things is going to happen. My company is located in the city of Virginia Beach. We don't do any work in the city of Virginia Beach anymore, not just because of these stormwater regulations, but because land just isn't available. But there is going to be economic development. And when that occurs, people are either going to look elsewhere or they're going to ask the Economic Development Authority to help them pay for the difference in the cost of your stormwater. So I appreciate everything that you're doing. I appreciate the opportunity you've given me to do this. My, my, if you're going to, I would, as opposed to voting on this, I would prefer you send it to the Process Improvement Steering Committee and give us an opportunity to take a look at this and come back to you with a recommendation later on. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Okay. We have one additional speaker, Chris okay. Wood. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Good evening. How are y'all? Good evening, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, and members of council. 
My name is Chris Wood. I'm with uh, McCluskey Real Estate, and I've been working in Virginia Beach for 30-plus uh, years. I appreciate all the time that you all have put into the stormwater issue. It's obviously very important to the city, but I'm here to ask that you deny the resolution to amend the comp plan. As you know, the comp plan is meant to be a planning document, not a technical building manual. It's meant to establish the vision for Virginia Beach's future. It doesn't address the number of parking spaces. It doesn't address where the fire lanes go. It doesn't address wind load ratings. All of that stuff is handled by staff, and they do a wonderful job. Uh, staff does a wonderful job not only on, on the site plan review, but also specifically on the stormwater. I can assure you that nothing will ever get approved in Virginia Beach without their approval on the stormwater, and they do a wonderful job working with people. And nothing's going to get approved without uh, meeting that stormwater code. I ask that you follow the recommendation of both the Planning Commission and the Process Improvement Steering Committee and vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. Do we have a motion at this point? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Moss. Well, I'll move and I have some discussion before someone wants to second it. Uh, I'll move that we adopt the proposed amendment to the comprehensive plan. So let me go back and see where we started from. Well, yeah, but I can have a discussion with that a second. Okay. Yep. Okay. How we started this. And I know some people said I didn't see anything in any of the public records. Well, the most important public record was the thing we voted on where 11 members of this council then, excluding Mr. Branch, uh, voted for this resolution. And I'm going to read it so that people can remember why we adopted it, because we wanted to make sure the bond referendum was successful and because the public expressed doubt that whether or not we would keep our commitment, and I'll come back to that. But this was adopted back in September, and it was voted by favor by Mr. Belushi, the mayor, Ms. Hemley, my good buddy here, Rocky, Aaron, myself, Lewis, Guy Tower, everyone that was on council at the time, and Mr. Branch had not yet joined us. And this is what this, and this was requested by council members Moss and Tower. It was a resolution making certain commitments regarding comprehensive mitigation for the bond referendum. Whereas changing weather patterns and sea level rise has validated by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA 2020, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the sea level rise adaptation study have demonstrated that the in-place drainage capacity, even in like new condition, is severely inadequate to protect the city from structures being flooded on a citywide basis, insufficient to preclude the future downgrade of the city's bond rating based on economic loss of even a single 100-year flooding event and recovery time, and the path to stagnant economic growth as investors pass us by. Whereas the sea level rise adaptation study and the city's modeling of our four watersheds and 15 drainage basins have validated the drainage capacity required to discharge the water from a 100-year event storm. So, in fact, we do know the capacity that the bond referendum would provide in this resolution so stated. Uh, with a 1% exceeding capacity, a 1% annual exceedance probability to prevent flooding of homes and businesses accounting for 1.5 feet of sea level rise. And why this is important? Because the changes we made during the workshop, and thank you, Tuck and all, that requirement doesn't have to be met by the developer because the bond referendum provided that one and a half feet of sea level rise at build out, and we took the interim risk. So that, I think that's an important thing. And a high tide of 2.3 feet over the mean average high tide, whereas the city staff has sufficiently scoped out the engineering material solution for the referendum, quality cost estimate for eliminating the backlog and maintenance of legacy ponds, ditches, and canals, and the installation of the 21 named projects on the bond referendum question. And whereas at the end of the 10-year period in 2032, 8% of the city will qualify for preferred FEMA flood insurance risk due to the completion of the 21 named projects and the bond referendum question, and the elimination of the backlog of maintenance of the city's legacy ditches canals and ponds. And whereas the 10-year build-out for phase two will commence to achieve the Virginia Beach high and dry by 2020, 2045, which addresses the second phase to come. And whereas meeting the existential threat of flooding will provide the quality of life for residents and a competitive advantage for a growing economy will be sustained. 
and whereas the city council previously directed the city manager to create a dedicated web page for the city's website that includes each phase of the projects, the progress, the dollar amounts, and milestones towards the completion of such projects, and to provide quarterly reports to the city council providing regarding the execution of the projects if the referendum question is answered in the affirmative. And 72% 72 72 of those voting did so. The City Council urges residents to carefully consider the issues of flood mitigation and plan to vote in November. To assist in the residents' deliberation, the City Council makes the following commitments, underscore commitments, which with the execution of number four will be delivered within the first three weeks if residents approve the question in November. Commitment one, the City Council will adopt a comprehensive financial plan to pay for the authorization of $567,500,000 of general obligation debt, which will include the following. The authorization of the debt to be repaid by a real estate tax of 4.3 cents, now updated to 4.1, for a 20-year debt basis, basis on the average annual increase of 3% in the city's taxable real estate based on July 1, 2021, land book, which was actually 9.3. The financial plan shall create a single appropriation unit into which all the bond proceeds are deposited and a single appropriation unit into which all the revenue derived from the increase in real estate taxes are deposited and such, and such funds shall provide all deposits and withdrawal information with sufficient granularity for the City Council and the Citizen Oversight Board. In furtherance of the long-term flood mitigation needs of the City, the general obligation bond capacity created by the retirement of the debt authorized by the November 2021 referendum shall be reserved exclusively for the issuance of bonds to finance phase two of the city's flood mitigation program and subsequent sea level rise projects and the establishment of a city citizen oversight board. And third, an amendment to the city's comprehensive land use plan goes back to the statement this body made a unanimous commitment to do, an amendment to the city's comprehensive land use plan that will recommend denial for any project or development that generates a net increase in water discharge demand in any watershed or in any drainage system and watershed over the capacity of the net margin to meet the model discharge of the drainage system. This gets back to the bond referendum capacity I talked about earlier. The planning department will recommend denial of any submission that does not conform to the former. Now, we heard earlier in this discussion about, well, does this, we could have rezonings. Well, if we built a capacity of what the, if you want to think of how this works, and I know we haven't talked about this much in a long time, every single property isn't building their on-site storage for a 100-year storm. That's not what's happening. Mr. Jones and I were at all those meetings. They're still doing the 10 acre, the 25, depending on the size of the property, is the amount of the storage that they have to retain. No one, you have to be a pretty good sized property, it has to meet a 100 year standard. But it has to meet the, that drainage capacity relative to the overall standard, and we are building the interstate highway system to handle all that water that's generated over and above what they have to do. So when we get that 100 year storm, those properties aren't holding all that rainwater. It's going to go to a certain, and then it's going to flow over and go into the larger infrastructure I call it the interstate highway system. That's being built. Well, if you do rezonings and you do other things and you put in more capacity going into that interstate highway system than it was designed for at the net outfall, then you have not kept the commitment of this, of what we said we were going to do. So this is the comp plan is in fact constrained. It's a policy document. It's a guide. It's not a legal document you can sue someone over. Uh, people have tried that have not been very successful. It's not a technical standard. You're right. It doesn't, none of that language says it's a technical standard, but it's saying that if all these, someone has to be keeping track, which is what planning and uh, public, public works is doing, what is that total capacity of that system at build out, and are we overusing it? And if we have, then we took the money from the people in bad faith because we told them that if they give us this money against the standard we defined, you are correct. When she read that standard, then you won't have water in your house. You'll have water in your street. 
You might have some water in your yard, but you won't have water in your home. That is the key of the system that we are building. And I, and I know, I, I don't know anyone who campaigned more for the bond referendum than myself, and I took this everywhere I went, and I know other people did too. I know the manager took these places, and people were looking. Uh, everything can always use improvement. If people think that the language can be improved, but I can tell you that 72% of the voting public expect us to keep this commitment. And I can't speak for the Planning Commission. They didn't give their word. You know, they didn't give their word to the public. They didn't go out and ask the public to sign on to $567.5 million of debt. But I did. And, and this is the thing I told them we would keep our commitment. So this body can do what it, what it wants as a majority. I gave my word. I spoke my word. The public supported these projects. I think they did rely on the commitments we made. That's what we voted for. And you might want to go back and repeal this first and then take a vote because you didn't mean what you said. That's possible. But uh, I, uh, I stand by my motion. Uh, we did a couple other things I'd like to mention with the bill. as Well, the amendments, people didn't have to fill up to get their garage done. Remember, Tuck remembers that. The number of things we did to reduce uh, the requirement and a lot of the, if it, since it was approved. But more importantly, the biggest thing we did is if a developer wants to make a commitment up front that he's going to not file amendments or variances, they don't have to do anything that they get to the, to the site plan formal approval. They don't have to go through all the work they used to do to show us that the, the plan had adequate stormwater. We got out of the business as just a straight zoning question. I think hopefully that will prove to be a major benefit. Uh, people have to tell us. But I stand by the commitment I made back in September. That's what we voted on. That's what we said. And I can't retreat from my, my word. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Jones, and then Linwood. I'm not going to repeat everything that Mr. Moss said because he's very eloquent in what he says has to say. Next week, we're going to vote on a budget. And in that budget, uh, it appears that there's going to be 4.1 cents of the real estate tax to support the stormwater plan that we took to the public and 72 percent of the public voted for it. If we don't approve this plan and get it going, and uh, then we should not be voting for 4.1 cent on the real estate tax next week because we're not keeping the faith with the people who we put the referendum before and asked them to tell us what they wanted us to do. So I'm very much in favor of going ahead and passing this uh, motion. I think we made a commitment to the public and not to do it would be in bad faith with the taxpayers of the city of Virginia Beach. Mr. Branch. Thank you, uh, Mayor. So I am the council liaison to the Process Improvement Committee, and um, you saw the position that they took. And as you all are aware, um, the committee is tasked with looking at the improvements from the revisions that were made by the committee chaired by council members Jones and Moss. And we're in the process of doing that. Um, we've had Mr. Tahan over. Um, we're getting uh, everything set up, and we want to find <coughs> out quite a few things. One, does the amount of time it takes to get a, something permitted in the, in the city, has, is that improving? And the number of submittals and resubmittals, is that improving as well? We're going to take a look at the cost of this uh, stormwater ordinance uh, for both the uh, private and public sectors. We're going to take real projects that um, are, are going on in our city and get some idea of, of the cost benefit um, and its impact on our ability to have affordable housing, to do redevelopment, and we want to get that information for the council. Also, uh, in terms of the public sector, 
um, what are the increased cost of public projects and impacts to economic development and we are we've already noted in our meetings that um, we're going to have to participate uh, with stormwater for economic development projects and we want to report to council what the full impact of that is so the committee feels very strongly that um, taking any additional action at this time uh, does not give the council the opportunity to have all of this information and everything that's been discussed previous to this has been theoretical of what the these revisions to this ordinance do but now we're going to get real-time information and uh, and take a look at uh, the impacts to the city and uh, and weigh it against what we need to do forward my observations are that um, this is a very stringent ordinance that's already uh, required one revision, so council must have acknowledged that it was. Uh, I think it was uh, it was put together with uh, engineering um, as the main focus, but now there's other consequences that I think it would be beneficial for the council to know about, and, and the Process Improvement Committee is going to work to bring that information forward to the council so that we can really take a look at at this ordinance and its performance and how it affects things that we really want to do like economic development and uh, affordable housing so i am going to uh, carry the message of the committee to this meeting and request that we um, also send this amendment to the um, process improvement committee it seems like there's a lot of concern that this only further strengthens an ordinance that we were trying to back off a little bit and now uh, as uh, mr. Martin said in this litigious society um, I I'm just telling you it's concern to the folks on our committee it's concern to the members of the Virginia Beach Planning Commission and there are consequences to um, further strengthening this ordinance before we understand all of the impacts of it I think it would be wise for us to to know all of the impacts and we have a process to get that to the council and then we can weigh all of it and I'm not sure personally that um, we may not want to take a look at at things as we get more information but right now to add more to it I think is not the direction to go in so I would make a substitute motion that we send the amendment along with the look at the revisions to our process improvement committee so we can bring back a full package for the council's consideration on this issue and that would be my motion motion is there a second, second. Uh, motion is second any other discussion miss Henley well I, I think we uh, we certainly know that as we are implementing the modeling that we're doing that it's been a, a time of adjustment for the staff to make certain that they are um, doing everything that we need to do requiring everything that we need to do and that's taken time and it's taken some time to work the bugs out but I hope that everybody else will remember too where we were last September in trying to get the confidence of the public that if they approved this amount of money for the bond referendum we weren't going to just turn around and keep and, and approve a bunch of rezoning that was then going to cause all of those improvements to not be adequate and it was that d need to assure the public that if they approved this bond referendum amount and we did all of that work that we were saying we were going to do and that we were going to change our standards and make it a system that would work that that it would that they could believe us and it's this whole question of confidence from our public 
And I would hope that the people who are now Monday morning quarterbacking would understand that it's important that we have the trust of the public. And now if we go in and start saying, well, wait a minute, we didn't mean that, that that's not good. And I think we can assure that that's the opinion that people are going to have, that they can't trust us. Because I recall when we passed this <coughs> amendment back to the Planning Commission to be reviewed again, because maybe they didn't have enough time the first time, the media reports was the city council is going back on its commitment. That's what the media reported, and that's what's going to be reported again. And I am not going back on my commitment to the public because I carried that resolution around when I spoke to groups and assured them that we were going to not just turn around and use this approval of the bond referendum as a reason to just keep on indiscriminate growth. And I think what we're doing is we're getting bogged down an awful lot in what might be if we don't change this at this point. I think the public <coughs> clearly understands that we have to learn how to use the regulations. And I think as Mr. Jones said that, and, and, and John, had, that there have already been some adjustments that have made in the way that, that we're doing and allow that there is some leeway if someone just commits that they're going to do what they have to do, then, then they get approval. Uh, I think you're, you're reading too much into this. The important thing is that we have to keep the trust of the public and we keep the trust of the public by not appearing to go back. And I, I go back to this letter that we just got from the chair of the process improvement committee. And he says, the proposed revisions are ostensibly the result of the resolution passed in September 2021. By using that word ostensibly, you're saying that we only, it only, we're only saying that it did that, that it really didn't do it. It was ostensibly that, that this is what was affected with the resolution. So here we are again saying we don't really mean what we're saying. And I take offense at that um, because that resolution was important in, in having people, 72% of the people gave us their trust. And that's what I've got to stick with. And, and it wasn't ostensibly at all. I meant it. And that resolution, I meant when I stood before the groups that this is what we were going to do. And we all know that the comprehensive plan is not an ordinance. It's a policy document. And we know that oftentimes we are presented with zoning regulations that don't exactly meet the comprehensive plan, but it's workable and so forth. And so we say this is what we can do. And, and if they can, if a developer can show that what he's doing is absolutely workable with the system we've got, then, then that's a reasonable thing. And I feel sure it's going to go. And to make all of this ruckus about having this statement in the comprehensive plan concerns me. And I, I, I'm, more, I'm more committed to the public in what I told them in that resolution that I wasn't going to just sit here and use that bond referendum approval as an excuse to just continue to uh, do things that will not be accommodated by the system. I think we can work it out with this. I think we can work it out in a, a reasonable fashion to, to make certain that we're not unduly uh, uh, hampering good development. Um, 
but I know how this is going to be re reported if we uh, if we don't adopt this amendment, and so I'm going to support the amendment. Okay, John. Well, I want to go back when we had the workshop because I, I want to make sure the staff and I don't, I don't think <clears throat> LJ is still here. But one thing we did wasn't negotiable was the standard. Throughout the whole process, we never changed the standard that this council adopted. And hopefully no process improvement plan would be changing the standard because they're dealing with process execution, not with the standard being executed. That's not the province of that group. But that's one of the things that we held to, the standard. And you may remember it. I met many places. How much rain in a 24-hour period? How much intense rain in a, and I think it was a two-hour period within the 24-hour period? And that became the standard for the performance of the system. And then they went and modeled and did for these 21 projects against that standard, against a certain tide level, what had to be the carrying capacity of the primary system that takes the water out of all the neighborhoods, out of all the places, and gets it to the final outfall. And then whether or not, and I'm not an engineering person, but spent a lot of time around them, but where do we need to have berms? Where do we have to have pumping stations? Where do we have to have floodgates? All that part was how we got the pricing for the 21 projects. And those 21 projects and those watersheds and those tributary supporting systems said what the underlying infrastructure had to be to support the water coming through the neighborhood. In the course of Prince Sam Plaza, there's a part that's not in phase one. It's having to what? lower the streets and put a 68, 60 inch pipe in the streets to get it final to completion. That's phase two. So I know many people here, so to make that all work, we can't have redevelopment that now is going to consume and put more outfall or more discharge into that primary system than it was designed or you're gonna get the same backup of flooding that helped us get the flooding on Plaza to start with, along with poor maintenance. So. It's the standard. And so our, so I think that's what we gave our word on. We are going to deliver the performance of that system. And no process improvement can change the fact we can't overload what we told people, that we weren't going to let the system's capacity and performance be degraded by development, that people were going to have to take care of that on their site or as you said, we build regional PMPs. We can overpay for the land, but we can still build them. Uh, or we can cost participate. But the project can't be approved if it's going to have that effect. And so, yes, someone is keeping an accounting. And that was part of that oversight board is to keep the real-time accounting along with public works of how much the capacity we are consuming, how much margin is in the pipe. Now, for those of you who aren't engineers, you fill up the whole pipe, it doesn't perform well. You can't use the total volume of the pipe if you're going to get effective flow of water. So they've done all that part. The standard, this is telling us we're going to hold, and the Planning Commission can do what they want. They're not elected. They don't have to, they didn't give their word to the public. You know, they just have their own view and perspective. We did. We gave our word. And I don't, you can't renegotiate your word after you've, people gave you what you asked them to do. So if we want to invalidate the referendum and have a whole bunch of new studies and ask the people again, that might be great. But after you've t taken their vote and acted on their vote, now you want to unilaterally negotiate and tell them, oh, we're going to do something different or we're not keeping our word. I, I think that's a hard pill to swallow, but I don't, I'm not going to be defending that. Other people, when they go out, they can tell folks why they, why they did. Well, in your case, you're not keeping your word because you never gave it. But, uh, but for the rest of us, we did give our word. And people are going to ask us why we aren't true to our word. And once you're not as good as your word, I don't know what, what weight you have as an elected official going out and ask the public to believe you on anything else. Hey, anybody else? Well, I, I would just say that the ordinance is the ordinance. And that's, that's the teeth of the law. And this amendment is sort of, it, you know, it. I, I, I would like us to really study the revisions that you two spent so much time on and the committee members and 
and look at all of these issues and, and make future decisions on this ordinance with the full benefit of all that information. So I think that's a prudent thing to do. So we have a substitute motion and a second uh, to refer this to the Process Improvement yeah. Committee. Any other discussion? Oh, we need to vote on this to see if we accept the substitute. Yeah, do we, we're voting to accept the substitute. You would be vote, yeah, you vote first on whether or not to make the substitute motion the main motion. Okay. You know, if I could just say this, you know, uh, briefly as, you know, somebody that really was involved in starting the process improvement yeah. task force. Well, the public who were going to do it. And that is to have an outside set of eyes come in and take a look at things, clarify things, improve things. And, you know, along the line, what you said, you know, earlier, Mr. Moss, about using the process improvement task force to improve the overall trash, a task force, or, you know, process. And, you know, for years, we had one of the things that we tackled early on in the process to improvement task force was how do we improve permits? How do we get plans done quicker, more effectively? more efficiently and i think there was a recommendation before that we refer to the process improvement task force ways to do that and that could be incorporated in other you know as we look forward to look at ways i am convinced that what we're doing will definitely live up to the intent of what we <clears throat> did when we passed the referendum the thing is, can we pass it and do it with clarity and understand that, you know, I, you know, substantive changes, I don't think they're going to be coming. But once again, uh, you know, let's let process take the outside, you know, set, take a, a look. And I guess one of the uh, concerns I had, we had a planning item in front of us about a week or so ago. It was in the Bayside District. And... They asked, uh, if I recall, uh, a studio apartment was going to be gone for 1500 a month, you know, or something like that. I, I'm, I'm trying to recall. But the other thing is, too, you know, we want standards in Virginia Beach. You know, we're going to have it. We, you know, we're going we're gonna to use that money. We are going to aggressively address flooding. But the other thing is, too, and, you know, and trust me when I'm saying I am not a tool of the developer, but we got to make, you know, make sure that Virginia Beach has a high standard, but a standard where people can come in, and, you know, and work because we're going to be looking at uh, infill development that's going to be happening, uh, redevelopment that's going to be happening. You know, we're going to have to reinvent ourselves forward. So in a lot of ways, it's going to be a work in progress with many, many challenges. But I think by at least going, uh, you know, to process, we're not saying no. What we're going to be saying is, that, you know, let's take a, take a look at it, maybe a whole picture on what's going on, how we can improve the planning. But once again, it would be helpful to have uh, the planning commission on board, but once again, I think we can make a compelling uh, argument, to, you know, to the public that we are going to do the right thing for the right reason and address uh, stormwater with the spirit. So let's go ahead. The vote is open for, uh, you know, deferring to uh, process okay. improvement. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this is to the substitute motion is to refer it to the process improvement. To accept the substitute. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bellucci? Aye. Councilmember Brandt? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? Aye. Councilmember Henley? No. Councilmember Jones? No. Councilmember Moss? No. Councilmember Tower? No. Councilmember Ralph? No. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. By a vote of six to five? The substitute motion now becomes the main motion. Correct. So okay. We can keep the same um, mover and seconder, right, Mr. City Attorney? Uh, um, sorry, repeat that. So, Mr. Branch and um, Mr. Bellucci can be the mover and the seconder, same one. We don't have to have a new motion. No, it's their motion, yes. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, the uh, vote is open on, uh, you know, the motion to pass, you know, what we just agreed. Can we, can we note in the record that it's deferred in, uh, indefinitely pending return back? I mean, yes. just so that it's clear. No, we, sir, because the media is going to report tomorrow. We might as well go ahead and do it. No, no I just mean that. The, He's Never referring mind. to how long the process improvement committee has to chew on it. We just gave them time. <laughs> we have two months or three months or yep. whatever. No, I want it done. Is there, well, the question is, is there a time? Pardon? The question was, is there a time? Well, that's the maker of the motions issue. Well, that can come out later. Let's just put this thing to rest once and for all because it's going to be reported. We don't need to have to keep having it over and over and over. Okay. Rock, did you have something? Well, my question was along those lines. How, how long are we talking here? I mean, he says indefinitely, but how, is there a definitive time, or can we? I mean, we have we have really chewed on this rag for a while, and I just want to know how long it's going to be. Lynn, with any recommendations? <laughs> we don't know. Well, I, I mean, I I couldn't give you a time. I mean, I mean when we, we get the information back, <laughs> we still have to get on to the oversight board for this. And, uh, and yeah, in the meanwhile, that. we can uh, do the o oversight board, get them on board, and uh, you know, move forward. So, you know, I would say, in depth, you know, let's make it indefinite at this point, and you know, we'll get it right. We will get it right. Okay. Okay. The vote is open. Well, I, I'm sorry. I need clarification now. So, <laughs> because is is it deferred indefinitely? Yes. Deferred and you indefinitely. Review by the. Okay. What, I'm just you know, what the motion. To defer and you know, refer to and the, uh, the such process, time as the process improvement committee can come back with a report on the things that we've been tasked with. Okay, I understand. I just okay. want to make sure okay. everybody understands what the vote is. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, thank you. So, so uh, we'll go through the vote again. Councilmember Bellucci? Aye. Councilmember Brandt? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? So, question. This is for an indefinite? Yes. Indefinite deferral on this? Yes. To go to the process improvement committee. And so we don't know when we'll see it back or when we'll when we'll have this back or anything. We will uh, we'll, we'll request that they expedite this as a priority. Aye. Councilmember Henley? No. Councilmember Jones? No. Councilmember Moss? No. Councilmember Tower? No. Councilmember Ralph? No. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. I vote of six to five. You have deferred this item indefinitely. I'm um, referring it to the process improvement committee. Okay, thank you. All right, at this point, uh, appointments. For the community organization grant review and allocation committee, uh, Rebecca Arizari. Arizari from the uh, New, York, New United Way of Southampton Roads, and then for um, the ITA, Kenneth Lamfield. Okay, is that it? That's it. Okay, we have the thing of the Council vote. Councilmember Bellucci? Aye. Councilmember Brandt? Aye. Councilmember Holcomb? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Tower? Aye. Councilmember Ralph? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. By a vote of 11 to 0, you have appointed those nominated. Okay, any unfinished business? New business? Okay, we are adjourned and we're getting ready for open mic.